Hello. Before you listen to this podcast, please go to my webpage, which supports it. You'll see 52 deal-making points that are especially important during a seller's market and when you're competing with other buyers. So pause this recording and go to partneroncall.com. That's partneroncall.com. And then see my post, How to Buy a Business in a Seller's Market. I'm Ted Leverett. I'm known as the business buyer advocate. I'm not a broker, never have been. And for some of you who don't know it, decades ago, I bought the wrong business the wrong way. And then I learned how to buy the right businesses the right ways. And I did 12, 12 acquisitions, and I sold every one of them for a profit. For more than 30 years, over 100,000 entrepreneurs and advisors worldwide have been relying on my books and my trainings. And they're using that stuff to, to finance or to buy and sell companies. I've also trained 298 people. These are independent advisors. They don't work for me. So they can better serve people buying businesses. Participating in this presentation are numerous people searching for businesses to buy. Plus two special guests, David Barnett, author, coach, and deal maker, and Nancy Felon Hooley of Velocity Law. She's a business, corporate, and M&A securities lawyer. If you're a seller, this is a wonderful time because the word on the street is it's, it's a seller's market. But if you're a buyer, you need to know how to avoid buyer competition. And I understand at least one of you has not seen buyer competition. Um, I had a client, actually two clients last year who didn't think they were, had buyer competition and they each put about six months into working a deal right up to near closing. Guess what? They were bumped, dumped. The owner said, sorry, but all along I've been talking to another buyer, I'm selling to the other buyer. So just because you don't see that competition, you ought to act like it's out there. Here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna talk about how to transform this so-called seller's market into a buyer's market. That's the goal today. My website is partneroncall.com and you wanna look for how to buy a business in a seller's market. Hey, here's the reality. We can control the marketplace. And the better you control the variables, the more likely you're going to achieve a done deal. And you're gonna do it sooner, it's gonna be better, it's gonna be more profitable in any kind of marketplace. Hey, the reason so many searchers fail to buy a business is they misunderstand the difference between marketing and sales. You know, during my work for searchers, only about 10% of them have prepared what the marketplace perceives as convincing material, 90% of searchers do not impress brokers, owners, or sellers. Now, these are the people who are sharing their information with me and they ask me to critique it. Here's another thing. According to uh, industry statistics, about a third of the searchers who are qualified to buy do not buy. And the reason they don't buy is again, they haven't transformed their marketing plan into a sales activity. They simply, they simply do not do a good enough job selling themselves. They just don't know how to pitch their capability to buy and operate. So why this disconnect? Well, one of the reasons so many searchers don't have an appealing marketing plan is they copy one another. One of the most important things that I'm doing for clients and searchers is to help them tweak their marketing plan. They, they need to be able to activate a persuasive sales program. And if it looks like every other searcher out there, you're not exactly doing yourself a favor. Look, no matter where you begin, no matter the order in which you evaluate, you're gonna need to control those deal-making variables you're looking at on the screen share. And it is like whack-a-mole. Every time you think you've handled one or more, another one or more pop up. And sometimes it's the same one. And then you're gonna to have to do a double take. And it happens because most of these variables, what you're seeing on that screen share, they affect some of the others. And that means you gotta change 
as you're moving along. And this is where your advisory team can come in because sometimes this begins to feel like a snake pit and somebody's got to be above the scene helping keep you, what, pointed in the right direction. Something I like to ask is who is selling whom? You want to be aware of a disabling or a fatal case of business buyer fever. Right now, business buyer fever is raging. It's contagious and it's fueling, it's feeding an unhealthy, a very unhealthy competition amongst business buyers. And that's playing in the hands of sellers. You know, one of the questions I'm asking, I have been asking for the last year, is value increasing or is it merely pricing that's increasing? You know, business brokers, among others, are saying that businesses are selling at increasing multiples. Multiples of what? Profit? Well, whatever. That's what they're saying. And you know what? There, there are some competing buyers. They're successfully outbidding ignorant searchers. Seems like a, a good way for winning to be losing, doesn't it? Okay, one of the questions somebody sent me is, Ted, how do you know when it is a seller's market? How do you know when it's a seller's market? Well, you believe it when people say so, or the seller is attracting buyer competition, or you're in a bidding war, or the seller is better than you at presenting and deal-making, or the seller's advisory team is better than yours. Or you wouldn't be hired if the company was advertising for a general manager. And the last one, the seller is not convinced you can successfully migrate into the company from whatever you've been doing. If those situations arise, it is a seller's market. The seller has the advantage. It's going to be very hard for you to overcome it. That's why we're going to look at these 50-some, some people call them negotiating angles. One, another question said, will buying the bubble burst my business acquisition? Well, it could. Too many people are buying small and mid-sized businesses because they're falling for the nonsense being pitched to them by sellers. And even worse, we're seeing so-called business appraisers in their reports, mostly or totally ignoring the effects of COVID on whatever business they're valuing. It's worse. And some lenders in the rush to approve unrealistic loans, they're putting buyers at risk. There's a huge surge of business sellers right now, and there'll be more. You're just reading the news, look what's going on out there in the supply chain, employees, et cetera. There are a lot of owners who wanna sell their business because they wanna avoid losing to the rising costs for labor and materials. Business in 20, 22 and 23 and 23 is not going to be like it was, even for a lot of companies that are doing real well. See, these, these owners are hoping for buyers to compete and in this seller's market, pay a premium price. So the timing seems right because there's also a surge of people looking to compete to buy businesses. I mean, there's a lot of social networking websites where the buyers and searchers have lined up talking to one another about it. Well, that's your competition, folks. Okay, I want to repeat something I started with. The better you control the variables, the stuff you see on that screen share, the more likely you'll achieve a done deal, a better deal sooner, and it doesn't matter what kind of market. Some people think they're going to ask dumb questions or say something that sounds naive. Hey, if you're a first-time buyer, it's better to say what you need to say here where you're safe than make a mistake on the playing field because sellers and brokers are not very forgiving. Anytime you want to talk to me privately, hey, go to my website. There's a place where you can schedule a, even a one-hour coaching session. Okay, look, I'm going to start it with comments on maybe three or four. Look at number 24. Relationship, Trump, everything else. You've got to get that FaceTime with sellers. I know that it's more difficult now, 
Sooner is better. You need to be very personalized. You need to make sure they understand if you have a family, who it is, you may hopefully like to meet theirs. You need letters that are highly personalized, scripts that you verbalize. You need to socialize with sellers and hopefully do it not just on Zoom, but go out to dinner, play golf. You need a network with sources of referral. These are people who may know sellers. You need to be very touchy-feely. When it, what the amateurs do, including these hot shots, MBAs that are running search funds and other things, they just think their resume <laughs> and their MBA should make sellers salivate for them. Well, it does not. Number 35, show evidence of your financial capability. Hey, you got to get the attention of brokers and sellers because there are people who know what they're doing out there wanting to buy a business and they are showing proof of funds up front written proof of funds up front and they're showing written pre-approval of borrowing they've got some letter from a bank or maybe some sba funder that says hey we're prepared to fund this kind of deal as long as the deal meets our criteria if you don't show that why should anybody pay attention to you how about number 38 you need to expedite your presentation and the acceptance of lois and purchase offers that's how some of my clients have lost deals in the last couple of years. They've just dithered along with the sellers thinking everything was happy land. And meanwhile, it opened the door for the seller to think about it. And if it was a broker, the broker was frantically trying to create buyer competition. So if you put out an LOI or a purchase order, limit the time to respond. Don't give them for a week particularly where there is a seller's market. And not all niches or sectors, there is a seller's market, but there are in quite a few. Okay, how about number 41? Minimize the contingencies and offers, but include, include escape clauses. Hey, one of the things I'm saying, I'm seeing, I'm not necessarily recommending it, but some of the buyers out there are offering full price to shut, that, shut the door on competitors because they're getting an exclusive time to what? Look at a business. Now, in number 42, in, in, in particularly in the purchase contracts, consider a escalation clause. And, and, and that's, that's where if there is buyer competition, the seller or the broker are legally committed to notify you so you have a chance to meet or beat the offer, kind of like we do in real estate. In other words, give yourself the opportunity to compete. Now, how, why would you compete? Well, maybe it makes sense. Maybe it makes sense for you in that particular deal. And a side benefit, by the way, is even if you lose the deal, you're learning more about the, your buyer competition in the sectors you're targeting. Okay, I am done talking, and I will now look at that chat box. Oh, hey, Ted. Um... I have increasingly seeing more and more of my clients who are being told by brokers that they better make a good offer because um, PE firms and family offices are taking a serious look at this deal kind of thing. And it's, it's arriving at businesses that are getting smaller and smaller. I used to hear that north of 500,000 of EBITDA. Now I'm starting to hear it in the 300s. Interesting. Interesting. Anybody have any comment on that? I'm seeing that as well, that it's not just an idle threat that PE firms are indeed becoming more interested in deals that are shockingly too small for them. But they have a lot of dry powder, uninvested cash. So they're going after whatever they can find. I got hired a couple of years ago by one of the top three richest families in America one of the cousins who was worth a billion dollars also. And he said, my family office, we're no longer competing with you know, the richest guy in the world, one of, we're now dropping down to these lower middle market businesses because that's where the inventory is. Interesting, huh? Evidence of financial capability. You're a lawyer, you're seeing these people trying to do deals. How important is this? It is. So not only uh, does the seller want pre-qualification to avoid the looky loos who aren't really capable of buying the business. And the lenders, of course, have their own qualifications, which 
are often, and rightfully so, steeper than a seller's qualifications. So there are going to be two loans normally in an acquisition. The loan from the buyer to the seller, the buyer, buyer is borrowing part of the money from the seller, or at least an earnout, which the buyer wants, uh, the seller wants to, to know that they're qualified to pay for that. And then the lender qualification. But what's been even more surprising is landlords doing qualifications on buyers. I just had a deal that um, got stalled for a 1231 close because my buyer, my buyer had, my, I was buyer's counsel. He had cash. He was all good. They had arranged to what was going to be paid now, what later. No lender involved. And the landlord did a full due diligence, financial due diligence on the buyer and held up the deal for a couple of weeks. Um, finally went through because he, he had cash, but yikes. I, you know, you don't think of the la landlord for the lease assumption being a factor to financing, but it is. Hey, you know what I'm seeing? I'll bet David is too. I'm seeing landlords not only doing that finan deep financial vetting of the buyer, but they're forcing personal guarantees. I don't care how you structure your, your legal entity to acquire the company. And they're also forcing leanable property. So Ted, be aware Ted. that most owners... Most landlords are very nervous when a business sells. You cannot expect a landlord to believe you're going to go in and be successful like the former owner. So a landlord is thinking, what, what if this person fails in this wonderful business? Dave, you said you're about to say something? Yeah, I just, I had a client who was supposed to close at the end of December as well. And, and there were other delays that caused them to move it to January 17th. And then the landlord wanted a fee to process the assignment and the fee was three months rent. Whoa. And so the buyer basically said, well, then you're, you're going to mess up this deal. And, and they're hoping to close for the end of January. But this is another negotiation round after the closing was supposed to have happened because the landlord figures that he's got an excited buyer that he can squeeze some money out of. Oh, my God. Another thing I'm seeing on the on landlord issues um, are that the landlord is requiring a personal guarantee both of the seller and of the buyer. So the guy getting out of the lease, the seller is still being held to a personal guarantee. And then of course the buyer is as well. And David, I've seen some, uh, I, I guess I'd call them some sort of fee. There's maybe a larger security deposit or something. They're, they're just extracting money out of the buyers because you're right, Ted, they're, they're nervous. It's always been normal course, uh, in a lot of the deals I worked on where the landlord will add the buyer no problem to the lease, but they won't release the seller. And if there's only a year or two left in the lease, the sellers usually just swallow it, you know, because they, they won't remain there beyond the next renewal. But that's pretty normal. Landlords love to be able to have as many possible options uh, if the rent is never paid. Just like all of us would if we owned the building add that I'm also seeing landlords um, re passing on all of their legal fees to the buyer and seller. So requiring the buyer, the seller who's getting out of the lease, pay all of the landlord's legal fees, both sides. And then the buyer and seller have to negotiate who, how they're going to split that. Holy cow. Somebody said, oh, Jimmy, what do you mean by why is that too much money floating around? What do you mean by that? Oh, I was just referencing um, the private equity companies stepping into the smaller deals and what might, like, why, you know, what's so interesting to them to step down here? Like, why, why that was happening? David, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, private equity is simply an investment vehicle for wealthy people and they're looking for a rate of return. And historically, these private equity people would buy stock market investments and things of this nature where they thought they could make a lot of money. And what we all know what's happened to the stock market recently. The valuations have gone through the roof. The valuation multiples are crazy. And so more and more of that cash is looking at buying private businesses. There's a couple of key points to this private equity thing. Number one, you have a lot of money looking for returns. Number two, when they buy a private company, there is no stock market telling us what that private company is worth. 
So these private equity firms, instead of using the stock market value, like if they bought a portfolio of stocks, they would have to report to their investors what the stocks were worth all the time as the price fluctuates. That's called marking to market. In, in uh, the current scenario, if they're buying private companies, there's no market to mark to. So they get to mark to model. So the private equity group then gets to say, we bought these five companies and according to our model, they're worth more now. So we're making money. But of course, we all know that you don't know truly what it's worth until you try to sell it. And so there's a lot of private equity groups presenting these great possible returns or pro pro prognosticated returns. And so they keep <clears throat> attracting more money and these managers get paid for funds under investment or funds under management. And so if they're sitting on cash deposits, <clears throat> their investors are made, they probably don't get to take a piece of that unless the funds are applied in some kind of investment. So you literally have buyers who are eager to spend more money because it allows them to start getting their fee off that investment for the investors. So it's, <clears throat> you know, um, it's something new. I mean, this has been a phenomenon that's existed in the bigger space for a long time, but these guys are coming into this small market space aggressively. Do they know what they're doing? I don't know. There's going to be some kind of shakeout at some point, maybe where some of these funds will have to realize losses. Who knows what happens when you make money almost free and print a bunch of it. Okay. Well, let's talk about free money. For those of you who are saying, Oh, why am I even listening to David talk about private equity? Where I'm looking, there's no private equity. Well, guess what? I live in a neighborhood where all my neighbor's houses in the last six months went up a million bucks. I have neighbors who have a million dollars extra they don't know what in the hell they're doing with, and they're out buying these small businesses, so now they're making even more money. We have people out there. Of course, I know it's been a bad week for Bitcoin, but one of my clients bought Bitcoin back when it was $4,000, even now when it's dropped by almost half. This guy's rich. And guess what? Bored to ever love and death because he doesn't have a job. So there are individuals out there. How about the stock market? Except for the people who are too stupid to get out of it. When it's at its peak and everyone's saying it's about to dump for a while, a lot of people are cashing out. And I'm talking about people buying mom and pop businesses. They're just paying cash for them. I'm talking about people buying a business at a price time of a million bucks. It's kicking out a few hundred thousand cash flow. There's so much money out there right now. And that's not good for buyer competition. That's where you've got to shine. Uh, no, I was just reacting to number 28. It says here, encourage sellers and brokers to provide, to prove the validity of competing offers. I was just, you know, practically wondering how you do that. Well, Mr. Broker, thanks for helping me on this business. I'm serious. I'm interested in buying it. We're not done with due diligence, but... If any other buyer shows up, please let me know, because um, as long as it's reasonable, I might be willing to try to outbid them. Now, if you're the broker, the broker says, woo, now we have somebody willing to outbid. So, so Teresa, you win two. No, Tessa, forget the Teresa. I'm sorry. Tessa. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, I know. I hate it when people miss my name, too. The, from the broker's point of view now it shows you're even more motivated. So that's gonna cause that broker to really pay attention to you. And guess what? If they're not gonna tell you, they're not gonna tell you. But by asking, at least it lets them know you're strongly interested in the business. And the reason that's important is most people who are buying their first business, they lose wonderful deals because they just can't pull the trigger. And brokers know that. And so you constantly, particularly brokers know that. But even owners, if they don't know what their lawyer or an accountant is telling them that, they're going to say, hey, look, at Tessa seems to be so interested in this business, but if she hasn't bought one, she might get scared towards the end. You need to be talking to other buyers. So the whole idea is you got to constantly prove your motivation. Anybody want to talk about that constantly proving your motivation? That's helpful. I just have a quick follow-up question to that, if I may. Um, you also mentioned timeline. What is what would you recommend in terms of how many days one should give to a broker, uh, both on the letter of intent, sorry, a broker or an owner, I guess, um, both for a, a letter of intent or an indication of intent and then a letter, um, an, an actual LOI? David? It depends on the scenario. If there's a, if there's a broker involved, then I, it, the business should be more prepared and the seller should be more prepared. So 24, 48 hours. 
if, it, if there's no broker and if it's a deal that a searcher has found on their own, if you give an offer to some seller, they likely don't understand what the tax, tax consequences might be. And it might take them a few days to even talk to their CPA. And so in those scenarios, a week. Let me comment on that before Nancy, but I'll tell you what I rec recommend to my buyer clients. And that is we're not submitting LOIs, letters of interest, indications of interest until we've educated the seller about what the process is. And if a seller says, I don't have a lawyer who can review anything. My books are a wreck and I really don't know what I'm doing. We say, well, you need to get somebody on your team who can respond because one of the first things we're going to do is give you a letter of intent to buy your business. And we can't do that and we'll see some documentation and you've got to have somebody who within a day can respond. Nancy? Most accountants and lawyers and valuation experts are so swamped right now that it is uh, here's what I say to my clients. I'm not a real estate closing lawyer. Don't give me the five-day attorney approval writer because I probably am not going to be able to make that because, and every deal is hot right now. So just be mindful of how busy people in this space are. And don't, I don't think you should ask them to turn something over a weekend if they don't have a lawyer or an accountant, lawyer and accountant on on the scene if they do have a lawyer and accountant on the scene then you can expect a, you know a couple days but if they've got to go find somebody it it's taken a while for people to find the proper counsel and accountant yeah i had that happen just a month ago where we had a buyer and you know, i represented the buyer and we had a seller they had a meeting of the minds and they said let's get this done let's get it done and neither one of them could get the attention of their legal counsel one took a week and the other two days. So even though I tell you that's what I recommend, make it short as time, a short fuse, the reality is you might not be able to. But the, the bottom line is make it as short as you reasonably can and try to train your sellers and brokers to be prepared for that. A Oops. quick comment that was on the PE thing yep. earlier that but I want to get too far away from it. And to David's point, and I think it was Jimmy, the you're, there are a lot of businesses out there that are technology behind HVAC companies, construction companies, anything in the trades, and even some manufacturing. The best thing for these folks is to spend a lot of money on tech to upgrade it, or even better, sell it to somebody who's got the tech wherewithal and the money to do the upgrades. So this is why PE people are starting to travel into this smaller business space, because there is a possibility to spend some money and turn it around very efficiently. So that contributes to what David is saying about the, the, you know, the dry powder. It's that there's a lot of these old school, old guys that are, you know, 70 that should be getting out because they can't run the business in what's required today. And they will be a great turnaround for a PE or a VC firm. And David, to your point about them, you know, maybe they're going to lose some money. They are, they're following the VC model. If we invest 20 deals and one makes a hit, then we're okay. And the other 19, we don't care about. So sorry to interrupt you, Ted, but I didn't want that to get too far past before we commented on it. Hey, we're going to jump in with any smart stuff we have. Okay, Nicholas, it's up to you. You're talking about let's revisit 39 and 42. Hi, Ted. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, so uh, to me, those two things kind of seem related to one another, but from my perspective, kind of sequenced. And and I wonder if there is a way to, uh, th if there's something that I'm either missing or there's a way to make this as, as smooth as possible. And to give you my two cents of, of, of how I view this, 39 for me is really the, the make it or break it point before you, before I would consider incurring due diligence costs, you know, hiring a lawyer, hiring an accountant, letting them loose on the data room. And in order for me to get comfort on that, I want exclusivity, right? In quotation marks, but exclusivity can take many forms, right? I mean, I, I would not consider exclusivity to be sort of closing exclusivity where, you know, during my due diligence period, the seller can talk to other people and then, you know, I come to the end of it, I put an offer in, but uh, all the while, you know, he was, uh, the seller was able to, to, to garner other interest and can present me, you know, at the end of the day with 
an offer I need to meet or a number I need to meet or terms I need to meet. So I want during my due diligence period to be the only one in the data room, the only one talking to the seller and my advisors to be the only ones in there as well, which then brings me to 42, right? Which is kind of a purchase agreement clause. You're always going to have outs, you know, financing outs, material adverse clauses, changes, what, what have you. But I don't think I would want well, well, if if I have structured the exclusivity correctly, I wouldn't want to have uh, to think about any other person's deals. So for the for the long wind up, but uh, hopefully you can make something of it. You know, Nicholas, sometimes we have to know when to hold them, and sometimes we have to know when to fold them. What I ask my clients to do is always have a minimum of two businesses in due diligence, hopefully three, so that if anyone starts to lag, we still have at least one other we're working on. And it's not that we abort a potential deal, but we don't sit there waiting for things to happen. And if you have two or three businesses in due diligence or even pre-LOI due diligence, well, you're in the game. You're in the game. And sometimes you just cannot get what you want. Okay. You, you nicely say to the owner, it doesn't seem to me like we have the meeting, a meeting of the minds right now, or owner, you're too busy or you're too confident. Keep me in mind. We'll touch base again, you know, somewhere down the road. Anybody else want to talk about that? That's great advice, Ted. Uh, this is Ruben. From a perspective of a searcher, I just feel there is no true exclusivity. I mean, you have to move fast but steady. And I'm working right now on closing a deal myself, my first deal, but uh, anything can really happen up until the closing date. And I'm learning that more and more. I get surprises along the way, obstacles, but what helps me through the process is having a good relationship with the seller. <laughs> That's why relationship is early in, in this checklist. It, it's the key. It's, it's, it's really, it really is key. Very few owners, I, won't, I don't know if it's very few, but quite a few business owners, price is not driving the deal. If all things are equal, they're going to pick the buyer. They're going to sell the buyer that they think is going to be best for their legacy, for their company. What about Linda? The competition from PE, is there anything here you want to talk about? Um, so yeah, I just would really like to discuss this idea about the market being very heated up and, um, you know, there's a lot of competition, private equity is dipping down into our marketplace, um, and therefore, um, working through brokers, uh, really presents a challenge because their job is to get the highest price for the pro for their, their listings and they're going to shop it and, you know, very quickly sell to the highest bidder. And that is going to be someone who's paying cash. It is going to be somebody coming in like private equity. And that is the environment that we're in. And so I would really love for you to um, describe how you suggest working with brokers, particularly that getting to the seller and developing rapport is also um, critical. And often they are in the way of that. And so, you know, uh, and they're because they're doing such a job trying to um, qualify everybody, you know, um, thousands of which ways, but, you know, I'd like to qualify the buyer, I mean, the seller, <laughs> as soon as they were trying to qualify me because I have, you know, deal flow and I would like to just get to the point. So what do you recommend in terms of working with brokers in a way that's optimal, particularly now given this environment? And why would that even be a good way to go versus trying to, um, you know, work on direct deal flow on your own? Okay, here's what I recommend. Give up the idea that brokers... Uh, want to create buyer competition. They do, but there's something else they rather do, and that's earn a commission sooner rather than later. And so one of the ways you can get the attention of brokers is to prove to them you're a motivated buyer and you are going to buy their listing as long as it's priced fairly and the other terms of the agreement are reasonable. Just think about it. If you're a business broker, Working with two or three buyers, yeah, sure, you might get the price up 10%. Guess how much extra commission you make on a price that goes up 10%? Negligible. You probably can't go to a good hotel for a weekend for the additional commission. So with brokers, be their first choice. I don't know why you're talking to brokers. Now, brokers, if you're listening to this, you know I start all my clients with brokers. And here's what we tell you brokers. We're starting with you, but if you don't have the deal we need, we're going directly to owners. Call us when you have the deal we want to buy. If you're talking to owners directly, well, the chance of buyer competition is much lower and there is no broker coaching the owner. Go 
direct to owners. Just interested too on this question about working with brokers because they're wonderful partners when you have you know the right relationship with the right brokers. With the deal structures that you typically see, you know, it's not really about the price. Actually, you know, um, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. It's about how what how the deal is structured because you know you'll pay a lot more if you can pay it over time or there's you know different. Um, there's seller financing or earnouts or other things. So it's not the price really, it's the, the deal structure. I wonder what you see in working with brokers in this very competitive environment. Are most of the deals, um, you know, 10% uh, buyer uh, down payment, 80% SBA loan, 10% seller financing? Is that kind of the model that you see ongoing in terms of deal structure or what does that look like? Well, I'll speak, and, and David, I'm pretty sure might want to talk about this too. I can I can talk only with a lot of knowledge on my deals. I tend to work on work with buyers who are purchasing a business that is a price of a couple million up to maybe five million. I mean, there are some bigger ones and smaller, but basically that's it. Maybe two million, five million purchase price. And in those situations, I tend to get hired by people who are pretty conservative. These are not the people looking to highly leverage. And so they're, they're not doing the 10% down. We're looking for a nice cash flow coverage. So we might be putting 20% down and we might be getting a seller to finance 20% and a bank or SBA might be at 60%. That's in the United States. In, in the UK, uh, a recent, I'm, I'm familiar with a few deals that recently closed, it's seller financing about 40% and buyers about 60% down or just the opposite. And I think part of that is they don't have something like our SBA. And, and in Canada, well, Dave can speak to the Canadian market. Go, go, Dave. Yeah, sure. Um, it's in, in Canada, it's, it's very different again, because it's more about the tangible assets within the business is going to dictate how much the bank is willing to do. I do work with people mostly in the main street space. So under half a million of EBITDA. What I can say about the deal structure you just described, you know, 10% down, 10% seller financing. There are an awful lot of brokers um, who really become reliant upon the SBA and they don't have a lot of deal making experience trying to figure out more creative ways of doing it. And if you find, uh, you know, this gets into the relationship thing and, and your comment about brokers, if you want to take advantage of a broker and the, the, the opportunity that the broker creates, remember they have a good relationship with the seller, usually create a relationship with the broker too. So that means doing the same kinds of things you would do when you meet a stranger at a dinner party to try to learn about them, you know, business brokering. Wow. That's really interesting. How did you get into that? Can you tell me about some of the interesting deals you've done? You know, what's the most creative thing you've seen happen and, and empathize with them. Say like, you know, I understand that you've really helped to put this package together and everything. And I'd like to move quickly and we'll make sure that we can get you paid as soon as possible. Like, you know, so, so hit those key things that the, that are in the self-interest of the broker and demonstrate to them that you understand what they're looking for. And you can actually have, I've seen many situations where a broker has applied a lot of pressure on a seller to push one candidate forward because the broker has the most confidence in that candidate. The, the, I'm not a fan of 90% leverage, uh, because of what Ted said about the cash flow, right? Um, and I've, and I've been on record for saying that I don't really believe the SBA helps people buy businesses. I help it. I think it helps them sell them. Uh, and if you think about that, it's like a, it's like houses, right? Yeah, sure. You can get a 90% mortgage and you know, the more leverage there is, the higher the price goes. And I've seen the same thing with small businesses. Canwall, you could speak up. I'll, let me first address the issue you bring up. It's any thoughts on buying versus leasing real estate. My opinion is think about cash flow and think about assets that you need once you run a business. Sometimes it takes more cash to do the deal if you're going to buy the real estate. So in some of the clients I've worked with, we've, we've convinced the owner who wanted to sell the real estate to just syndicate it out and sell it to an investor. And we stay in position and keep paying rent and we're not on the mortgage, so to speak. If you're, some people think real estate right now is at the top of the market. Maybe now would be a good time to lease because you may be, be able to buy that building four years from now for less money. Thank you, Ted. This is Gunwell. Uh, thanks for bringing it up. 
The reason I ask is because I'm in California. A lot of the, I was looking at some truck stops and the, these places are normally, you know, with property, you know, with they, they, they don't just list the enterprise, but they want the property to be added to the enterprise value as well. And when you ask them to do lease or something, they said, no, we, we, the owner is very eager to do the, to sell the property as well along with the business. Hey, I'm from California. I live in Florida now, but this business I started in Cal in Silicon Valley. Guess what? Back then my buyers, including the ones I work with now, we will go get the investor. We will go to the, we'll find a real estate investor. We buy the business. The real estate investor buys the real estate. The seller leaves escrow closing with the money. We don't, you don't have to tell the seller to go sell it somewhere. And if it's a broker listing, guess what? The broker would love to get an additional commission and, and the broker may very well either do a co-brokering arrangement with a commercial real estate agent or just sell it separately. It's really easy. I cover this pretty thoroughly in my book called How to Buy the Right Business the Right Way because this is a big issue. Linda? You're back here, number 41, contingencies. What do you mean? The number 41, you talk about um, to use, you know, as few contingencies as possible um, and be sure to include escape clauses. Can you just elaborate on that in terms of what contingencies, if you're trying to minimize them, what would you prioritize and what escape clauses, you know, are like fundamental in your deals? Well, a lot of it has to do with what you did in pre-LOI or heads of terms due diligence. If, 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 if the business you're looking at has decent books and records and the, the owner is making representations that are provable, those are fewer and fewer things you need a contingency for. And if very early you have your legal counsel give you an overview of the kinds of things that go wrong on the kind of deal you're going to do for that kind of company, they'll tell you what the reps and warranties are going to need to be. You run them very early. Sometimes we even do it at pre-LOI pre due diligence or immediately thereafter, we say to the owner or a broker, here's some of the issues we know that are going to come up that are the soft ones. Let's talk about right now that we're, we're going to need, we're probably going to need some contingency. We can't just buy this thing blindly. Now, if there's a broker involved, they use their salesman magic to, um, you know, do a number on you and the seller. If there's no broker involved, <laughs> you probably don't even have to bring this up. You just wait until that point where you're getting into strong negotiation with the owner and you say to the owner, here are the things that you need to protect us on. Keep in mind these owners, they don't like trying to sell a business. It's even right. worse trying to sell a home. They don't wanna go through this again. And if you spend a month or two with them and they like you, uh, they're gonna be pretty much willing to do anything within reason as a contingency. David, you see this all the time. Honestly, I like to see the structure with a good deal of seller financing subject to offset in the case of a misrepresentation or an undeclared liability. And I, I find that the more you can offset risk in the structure, the, the less important your reliance on some of the due diligence stuff. And, and the, the seller though needs to understand that they still have skin in the game post-closing, that they're going to be honest and forthright and, and clear with you. And the legal remedies can be so expensive that it's it's kind of silly to rely on the paperwork if it, you know if you did have to a real problem with the seller post closing it costs you tens of thousands of dollars for a legal solution then neither you, you're not going to win even if you win so that's a good point and you know what that relates to what Linda says what do you suggest as far as mitigating due diligence costs blah 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 you'll see it in the chat. This is why you need to have two or three businesses at all times in play so that when it begins to look like you could go deep into a potential deal and have it fall apart on you, you don't have to start all over. Remember, you have to know when to fold them and when to hold them. Okay? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to try to drill down on that question a little more specifically, if you would, just as far as, you know, when you start the clock on due diligence, because, you know, then you're starting to pay cash. Yeah. There's a fine line between getting as much information as you can before you start to bring in the guns versus not getting them in early enough so that you get to the information that might cause you to say, okay, now it's time to cut bait. But what do you do to mitigate those costs? And oh, it's particularly with a broken deal in a heated up environment like we're in, sure, there's LOIs and there's, all, and there's ways to get out of LOIs, right? There's always ways to remain within the confines of the LOI and then find a reason when they know that there's somebody else that will pay more or 
whatever their issues might end up being. Um, and, and so to mitigate these broken deal costs, I mean, it can run up to $100,000 and then there you are. What do you recommend? How do you work with your clients? Um, you know, what do other people do to make sure that they don't end up with tens of thousands of dollars in a broken deal? Well, my old advice, you know, when timelines were a little less compressed was to create an order of operations for your due diligence, an order of importance. So I always told people to start with financial due diligence, including just adding up the deposits on the last 12 months of bank statements and make sure that it adds up to what they say the revenue is, you know, just, just some very basic things. And then you get deeper into the financial due diligence when your accountant says like, I'm 60% certain that it looks okay. Then you get the attorney to begin. So you, you, you kind of stage it as so that the biggest potential hazards can be identified earliest. So you don't spend the money with some of the other advisors. Go to my YouTube channel, go to Ted Leverett, look me up on YouTube. I did a webinar a month or so ago on pre-LOI due diligence. And there is just about everything you need to know on that topic. The better job you do in pre-LOI due diligence, the less work you're going to have to do after the LOI during formal due diligence and the less risk. The second thing, while you're at that YouTube channel, look at my two, two presentations on how to handle SIMs, uh, you know, confidential information memorandums, those kind of things. Look at those two videos because you'll see what it's supposed to look like. And it's not, believe me, most of you are not going to see what it's supposed to look like. So we show you one that's absolutely horrible, but don't stop there. Look at the one that's really good that still has work to be done. And I think if you see those two things, you'll get a sense of, is it even worth doing any formal due diligence? One more time, have two or three deals in motion. Don't do them one after the other. And guess what? You will end up eating money. If you think you're going to get a seller to agree that if you bail out, they will help you pay some of the costs. No, I don't think it's going to happen. Not today. Yeah. Does that, does that ever happen? You know, when due diligence um, uncovers you know, blatant misses in terms of what the seller has presented in, in their information, even if it's not intentionally done. I mean, how does that ever sort of go in your experience? And also working with lawyers when there's a broken deal, and do you see some kind of understanding that, you know, in a broken deal, the costs accrued flow over into the next deal, you know, subsequently maybe at, you know, one you know, a 50% increase in the fee or whatever, you know, whatever you have to work out so that you're not writing checks constantly and while you're moving through deals that end up flatlined. Yeah, Linda, there are a whole lot of searches out there sharing information about that stuff. It's nonsense. Is it? That's why yeah, I was pretty asking. much. Yeah. And, and here's, I mean, it's, it's happened in the history of the world, but the reality is on these businesses that are selling for prices under about 10 million, which is where the private equity generally is not, you individual buyers, you don't have that power to cause owners to take any risk because there are enough individual searchers out there who don't know enough. They don't have the right kind of team and they're competing with one another and it wouldn't even occur to them to do this. So sellers really are in charge. They have the company. You want it. If you don't play their game, there's another buyer in line. What you're and how, talking and how, true, how true is that in non-broker deals? Anything, because the lawyers for the for the seller, I mean, before any seller is going to agree to that, even the, even the most naive owner is going to run it by a lawyer. And the lawyer is going to say, no way, you're going to spend a lot of your time talking to the supposed buyer who's never bought a business, who could get cold feet, and it's going to cost you money because you're not only paying me, the lawyer, but you're taking staff in your company to prepare all the documentation. What I'm letting you know is you can ask for it, you can wish for it. I'm talking about shifting risk onto them for, you know, things they screw up. No, I just told you, no. That's, that's what I mean. Not things like I decide I no. don't like this deal, but that they've done something that's actually inappropriate, no. even if it was unintentional. Okay. No, no. I could give a searcher perspective too on that, on, on the mm -hmm. deal I'm on. I mean, I'm all in. It's just, in a way, it is a gamble. I mean, five grand to the attorney, five grand non refundable to the bank for the SBA loan. Um, but what I rely on is my relationship with the seller, knowing for sure he is motivated to sell. Um, but in the contract specifically, Linda, there's nothing that says if this falls through, they're responsible for my fees. Really, it's a gamble I got to take. Um, yeah. And, and of I'm course, really looking at everything. 
Yeah, and, and I mean, I'm not really worried about 5,000 here and there. I'm talking, I'm worried more about when it gets further along and there's tens of thousands of dollars of like, you know, and suddenly you realize that these guys have presented some kind of, you know, faulty information that has caused you to continue to, you know, evaluate when, you know, that's really more. But I appreciate that, you know, that perspective. Well, okay. Linda and everybody else, this is why you better have the right advisory team because they will milk you to death if you give right. them the opportunity. It's risky to buy a business. Okay, Ruben, is there something else here? I'm a searcher working on my first deal. LOI, anything can happen to closing deal? You're just telling us to move quickly. Is that it? Yes, that's that was, um, I, I was just speaking in regards to someone else's point on, on the exclusivity for the LOI, uh, just recommending to, to move swiftly, but in, in a way it's, how do I say, it's difficult to to have that true exclusivity because anything anything can fall through in the deal i mean up until the closing date so if the bank is giving a even shorter closing date uh my advisory team i mean i do have a great advisory team and that's helped me out along the way they tell me just move fast on it because you never know what can happen on that day before closing god forbid something happens to the seller or let's say they come across a large contract and all of a sudden they're going to get really rich guess what that deal might fall through so that was just some something i wanted to share with the group hey ruben you also talk about there's no true exclusivity even if your legal loi clearly is legally binding you say you're not sure you follow the argument here's what i think if your loi binds the seller to exclusivity what stops the broker from lining up a whole bunch of buyers just waiting to see this deal second of all this, this, has, this sort of relates to what Linda's talking about. What if the seller who agrees to exclusivity during an LOI and while you're in formal due diligence is talking to other owners? How are you going to know that? How are you going to know it? And if you find out, what are you going to do about it? Your lawyer is going to say, you're, you lost the deal. You're going to say, well, I put 50,000 bucks into trying to do the deal. I want to sue that seller or maybe the broker. And then the lawyer says, well, do you have three or four years and maybe a hundred thousand bucks to go after this? Or would you rather go buy a business um, and maybe not go through this and start making money? It's risky to buy a business. This is where you got to have the absolute best advisory team. Aaron? What do you mean tips to sell yourself as a preferred choice when you're out of state? I work with clients all over the world and we buy businesses all over the world. You just have to what? Present yourself that you're financially capable of doing the deal, that you're out of area location is not an impediment. And you're going to keep that seller and maybe broker so busy helping you get the deal done that you're the buyer they work with. All I can say is you just have to present yourself with your bona fides where the owner or broker consider you to be first choice. I mean, my, I wrote two books on this topic. If you just read them, that's what you have to do. If you do those things, you're the first choice. If you don't, well, then somebody else will. Oh, be careful of uh, <laughs> the standard reps and warranties and, and the uh, sharing of LOIs and contracts. That's really for fools. It's really for fools. You, ne you need to make sure this stuff is tailor-made for you because guess what? It costs a whole lot of money to revise stuff and no broker or owner wants you to revise something because you use the boilerplate up front. But now that you're real serious, here's the real deal. Not a good idea. Okay, we're done. I really appreciate it, folks. You can do better if you contact me and we build or improve your searcher marketing plan. You can learn more about searching by reading my book, How to Prepare Yourself and Find the Right Business to Buy. And my other book helps you achieve worthwhile deals, How to Buy the Right Business the Right Way. You will save time. You will save money. You will achieve better deals if you do what the savviest buyers do. I'm available to help you deploy the tactics and strategies from my books. You can get them on Amazon. So I'm Ted Leverett, the original business buyer advocate with Partner on Call Network. Thanks for listening. Hey, you. That's right, you. Have you been looking to buy an exciting and profitable business? Are you tired of searching? but only finding barriers that impede you from owning a wonderful business. Well, have we got some good news for you. 
You can find and buy the right business the right way. And you don't have to go it alone. For over 30 years, author and transaction advisor Ted Leverett, the original business buyer advocate, has been helping buyers worldwide achieve win-win done deals. Ted Leverett says, you can't buy it if you can't find it. You see, buying a business is all about search. Because if you can't find it, you can't buy it. It's about being best and first. First on the scene with sellers and being the seller's first choice and top of mind for brokers and sellers. And most importantly, avoiding buyer competition. What about having to compete with other buyers? Well, you have to outbid them, which is a good way to pay more than a business is worth. Searchers do better with a winning business buyer marketing plan. And that's where Ted Leverett comes in. He'll help you prepare a winning plan. And then he'll guide your actions so you can find and then buy the right business the right way. But searching is not enough. The reality is too many people buy the wrong business. Or they buy the right business, but on the wrong terms. That's why, if you want to buy the right business the right way, it makes sense to have Ted Leverett, the original business buyer advocate, on your advisory team. And one of the best ways to know what the savviest searchers and buyers do is to read Ted Leverett's books, How to Prepare Yourself and Find the Right Business to Buy, and How to Buy the Right Business the Right Way. You can get them at his website, partneroncall.com. Don't chance it. Right now, go to partneroncall.com, get the books, and schedule a free and private telephone conversation with Ted Leverett.